All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Tom Mason. I am the Communications and Outreach Manager here at LASP at the University of Colorado. And uh, we have these gold webinars about every other month. Um, we'll have a couple more um, as the instrument is uh, going through some testing and getting calibrated and turned on. Um, we'll, we'll continue to do these webinars and then we look forward to having our first data from the mission. Uh, we expect that in early October at this point. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stan Solomon. Stan is a scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and their High Altitude Observatory. He specializes in the physics and chemistry of the upper atmosphere and ionosphere. Stan received his undergraduate degree from Harvard College and his PhD from the University of Michigan. And seen, soon after leaving Michigan, Stan worked at CU Boulder's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, where I am now. Uh, he participated at last in the Solar Air Glow Rocket Program, uh, the Timed Mission, and the Student Nitric Oxide Explorer, among other projects. Stan has been at NCAR since 2000, where he currently leads their Geospace Frontier section of the High Altitude Observatory. He's currently working on upper atmosphere model development, the effects of solar and geomagnetic variability, and air glow simulations for the gold mission. And Stan, I am going to turn it over to you to share your PowerPoint. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you. And I'll just say one other couple of things, I guess. Uh, we are recording this, so if you don't want to be recorded, you could drop out or just don't use your video. And then also, if you have questions for Stan, please use the chat box to ask those questions. And we'll get to those as we have time throughout or at the end of the presentation. OK, well, thank you. I'm. Uh going to cover a lot of ground here today. Uh, the title is uh, Solar Storms in the Ionosphere. I could, I could say uh, space weather in the ionosphere and the thermosphere. Uh, most people consider the region of the upper atmosphere we're talking about to be the ionosphere, but I'm going to try to explain that it's a little more complicated than that. And so, um, pardon me here while I just adjust my screen before I, I get going. I'm going to move this little box out of the way. So, um, so I'm gonna give an overview of, the, of where these solar storms come from, why we call them space weather, and why mu much of space weather manifests, uh, manifests it in the uh, therm ionosphere thermosphere system, give a little overview of what that is. Uh, for those of you who, who didn't see uh, Principal Investigator Richard Eastus's seminar a couple of months ago, I'll give a quick review of the gold mission uh, or just a uh, 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 little bit of a refresher and tell you what we hope to observe when we start taking data in uh, October and then a few words about what we hope to learn from all this. So I'm going to start by, by uh, showing some uh, photographs of the eclipse of last August. Uh, not, not my photographs. Uh, but uh, Miroslav Druckmiller has posted some uh, rather spectacular stuff, uh, very, very enhanced imagery. And, and uh, the reason I, I just wanted to, to do that is, is to recapitulate some of the history of, of solar physics and space weather that was motivated in the early days by, by solar coronal observations, which were at that time were really only possible by looking at eclipses. And we can see from this next one that, that uh, the solar corona really extends far out into space and, and becomes the solar wind and uh, controls the solar interplanetary magnetic field. In some sense, you could say that the Earth is inside of the solar corona or the extended solar corona, and that's why we get so much uh, interesting activity out of it because the solar corona and the solar wind is a very dynamic place, driven largely by these active regions on the sun here that we can now see from space-based missions by looking in the extreme ultraviolet portion of the spectrum and the X-ray portion of the spectrum. These, these active regions are related to sunspots. They're not 
the same thing as sunspots, but they emanate from the same phenomenon, which is the magnetic activity that is driven by the solar cycle. Here, uh, essentially, it's solar maximum, where, there, where there's a lot of magnetic activity. You can see these, these belts of, uh, of, of emissions, bright regions, which are interesting because uh, you can almost see the magnetic arches forming over the, the, over the active regions. And if we look at the, at the solar cycle in the way that we had accessible to us prior to the space age, which is by looking at the sunspots and seeing where they were on the sun and counting them, uh, we can see most prominently that there's a very periodic 11-year cycle to the, to the number of sunspots and indeed to the uh, solar activity in general. And then in addition to the very periodic behavior, there's a possibly periodic but unknown just how variable the magnitude of the solar cycle is. And you can see that some cycles are a lot bigger than others and there seems to be some sort of pattern to it. You might be able to make up a story that says that uh, we're now in a period of declining solar activity, but it's hard to say. The sun always has some surprises for us. And if we look at that solar cycle in x-rays, we can see how it progresses from uh, here at solar maximum. These are essentially one year intervals all the way down to solar minimum. There are very little active regions, very few active regions on the sun, very few sunspots, and then back up to the solar maximum. Uh, we're currently sort of at this stage here, uh, going into a solar minimum period, uh, perhaps a particularly deep solar minimum period, time will tell. So, so when you see these, these uh, eruptions on the sun, uh, we have flares and coronal mass ejections. They're related phenomena. They often come together. Again, they're not the same thing. Solar flares are a large uh, enhancement in the X-ray and, and, and ultraviolet regions of the spectrum that are often in conjunction with these uh, events where the mass is spewed out of the upper solar atmosphere, the corona. And here from a, a wider angle, you can see the uh, dramatic uh, ejections right out into space from this image here. And, and when those impact the Earth, or when they reach Earth, they can have uh, a big effect on the ionosphere. Associated with these events are, in addition to uh, photons, energetic photons, X-rays and, and ultraviolet. We also can get solar energetic particles, uh, essentially protons and other ions that are very high energy that only take 15 minutes to an hour to get to the Earth. The, the photons, of course, are traveling at the speed of light and get here in eight minutes. And, and they can uh, be dangerous if you're not inside the atmosphere, i.e. if you're a satellite, say, in orbit or an astronaut. So here's a cartoon from NASA. I call it a cartoon video because it's supposed to be uh, representative but not physical. It shows you what a halo CME would look like. That's a halo CME is one that's directed toward the CME again is coronal mass ejection. So the mass in this case is, is uh, electrons and protons that, that disturb the solar wind, change the interplanetary magnetic field. And when they reach the magnetosphere, they cause recombination reconnection, sorry, deep in the magnetotail of the Earth. And that's a region that connects to the polar regions of the Earth, or the magnetically polar regions of the Earth. And energetic particles flow down those field lines and cause the aurora at high latitudes. The, uh, uh, let me uh, try to advance here. And give you a more uh, schematic representation of this. When the uh, solar wind, which is supersonic, reaches the magnetosphere of the Earth, which is essentially the area where the very large area where the or volume, where the plasma is controlled by the magnetic field of the Earth, we form a bow shock up, up, upstream of the Earth because the, uh, the solar wind is supersonic. And you get this long tail stretching all the way out to lunar orbit in the magnetosphere. And then this plasma sheet region is the origin of the auroral particles which, which flow down magnetic field lines and into the Earth's upper atmosphere and ionosphere. And, and more importantly, the, these field lines uh, connect 
the electric circuit of the magnetosphere, the electric circuit of the ionosphere, and cause currents to flow. And these heat the ionosphere and thermosphere, especially at, at uh, high latitudes, but that heating uh, spreads out to all latitudes. So here's a model representation of this process. This is a magnetospheric model showing how the, the uh, region responds to a geomagnetic storm. This, uh, this cloud of gray lines is, is the last closed field line along here, which uh, particles can flow down into the ionosphere and thermosphere and cause the aurora. And, and just to, uh, whoops, we go back to slideshow mode here. And, and when we, when we, um, when we reach the, uh, the upper atmosphere of the Earth, uh, these energetic electrons come down, they, they're, streaming, they're streaming in spiral paths along the field lines, connecting to the high latitudes surrounding the magnetic pole, the so-called auroral oval. And there they emit ultraviolet light that you can see from space, and visible light that you can see from the ground. And you can imagine these, these auroral arcs, that there's these, there's these strong currents, the auroral electrojet flowing along the arcs, and they are interacting with the upper atmosphere of the Earth and, and ca causing heat to, to be transferred to, to the atmosphere. So that has a lot of impacts, uh, especially in the ionosphere. Uh, just a few of them are uh, disruptions of, of navigation systems, such as GPS, because it changes the transit time of radio signals to the ionosphere. You can have disruption of communications by some of the same processes. These energetic particles, can be dangerous if you're a satellite in orbit or a human in orbit. And so we want to have better, uh, better specification and predictability of these phenomena. The, the, the particles are hard to predict because they come here so fast. Uh, if you see something happening in the sun, the particles may not be very far behind the photons. In the case of the ionosphere, we have a somewhat uh, uh, of an advance warning because the solar wind takes a day or more to get here. And so disturbances in the solar wind and the interplanetary magnetic field, which is essentially the extended magnetic field of the sun, uh, uh, give us at least some idea of what might happen when we see something on the sun. And then when it does reach the Earth, we can attempt to describe and even predict what it will do to the ionosphere and thermosphere. So I'm gonna give a little overview of this ionosphere thermosphere system. And Again, most people would say ionosphere. I usually say thermosphere, and I'll, and I'll show you why in a minute, uh, because the ionosphere is really just part of the thermosphere. But uh, it was discovered first, so we call it the ionosphere. Here's an overview of the atmosphere and temperature structure, just a global mean, average, typical, empirical ion, um, uh, atmosphere. It's divided into troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. These spheres are defined by pauses, which are the local minima and maxima in the temperature profile, the tropopause, stratopause, and mesopause. Uh, below the mesopause, about 100 kilometers, the atmosphere has very little uh, change of a systematic average nature in response to solar activity. Once you get above 100 kilometers, solar minimum and solar maximum look very different in this thermosphere region, which, as you can see, is very hot, which is why we call it the thermosphere. And I'll show you the reason for that in a second. Uh, the, 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 uh, the essence of it is that, that uh, that's where solar activity is, is uh, manifested. But before I do that, I want to show you something else that's very different about this region of the upper atmosphere. Below about 100 kilometers, the atmosphere is fully mixed by turbulent processes. All of that weather and, and small-scale turbulence that mixes everything together. So the major species, the major chemical constituents, molecular nitrogen, N2, molecular oxygen, O2, uh, become fully, fully mixed, about 80% nitrogen, about 20% oxygen, and, and they have the same uh, proportion all the way up to 100 kilometers, even though that density is dropping by a factor of a million. Uh, and, and when you this is a logarithmic scale in density, so the atmosphere is dropping off logarithmically extremely rapidly. By the time you get to 100 kilometers, most people would say that's space. That's almost a perfect vacuum. But what happens up there, because it's, it's uh, 
that's so empty is that the gases start to diffusively separate. And that means this turbulence is no longer effective in mixing them together uh, homogeneously. So, so the lighter things literally float to the top of the atmosphere because, because they're not mixed enough to constrain them to stay down. So, so what you have here is things like atomic oxygen taking over and floating to the top. Now, notice that the molecular oxygen, O2, is going away, and the atomic oxygen, O, is increasing. What's happening is that in this region, the O2 is being broken up by energetic photons from the sun, ultraviolet light, and it's turning into atomic oxygen, O. And so the atomic oxygen floating to the top eventually takes over what from the molecular nitrogen, and you have atomic oxygen dominating the upper thermosphere. But molecular nitrogen dominates the lower thermosphere. So you have this changeover from nitrogen to oxygen, and I'll be saying a lot about that. So, and, and incidentally, I, I'll, I'll probably start just saying O, O2, and N2 to these chemical species that are pretty well known. But uh, atomic oxygen, O, is a, it's a little bit unusual. Um, I'm glossing over a lot of details, of course, in this lower atmosphere. Theory. In the middle atmosphere, you have a lot of ozone. So into this atmosphere, we pour sunlight. And this is a, a very broad overview of the solar spectrum. Yellow, because the sun is yellow in the visible. And notice again, logarithmic scale. I'm going through seven orders of magnitude here. So, so uh, almost all of the sunlight is in the visible. It drops off very rapidly in the ultraviolet and the infrared. Now, what I've done here is I put a solar maximum spectrum in red behind a solar minimum spectrum in yellow. So you can see how variable the sun is in sunlight. I'm not talking about particles now, but light. And how much it's very variable in the X-ray region, maybe even a factor of 10 from solar minimum to solar maximum. But by the time we get back to the visible, it's hardly variable at all, less than a tenth of a percent. In the Middle ultraviolet and far ultraviolet, it, there's some variation, but it's so small that on this scale you can barely see it. And then as you get into the extreme ultraviolet, a variability of the factor of two or three, and that's very important for the ionosphere. So where does that energy go? It lands at various altitudes in the ionosphere and, and atmosphere, depending on how readily it's absorbed by the various uh, atmospheric constituents. Visible light out here, around 400 nanometers, makes it all the way to the ground. Near ultraviolet light, around 300 nanometers, gets absorbed by stratospheric ozone. And fortunately for us, only a tiny bit of it makes it to the ground. As you get into the far ultraviolet, the uh, photons, the light, are, is absorbed higher up, mostly by molecular oxygen, O2. And that's a lot of what creates ozone. And then as you get to 100 nanometers and shorter, all of this radiation, and remember there's not much of it left, it's very small compared to the visible radiation, but it's absorbed in the thermosphere. And it's absorbed up high because it, it creates ions, it, it ionizes the thermosphere and strips electrons off it. And the cross sections for doing that are pretty large out here in the uh, extreme ultraviolet. And so this light is absorbed up around 100 to 300 kilometers where it creates the ionosphere by ionizing the nuclear constituents. And, and that part of the spectrum, the solar spectrum, remember, is very variable in this region, and that's why the ionosphere is very variable. And you can see that in an average plot of the ionosphere, the solar max, the peak is much higher and, and, and denser, and there's more ions and electrons. And, uh, and then Comparing the solar maximum in the blue here, solar minimum typical curve, solar maximum in red. The dashed lines are at night. At night, the ionosphere goes down because there's no sunlight to make it, but it doesn't go away. It's not at high altitudes because it's fairly long lived. At low altitudes, the ionosphere mostly goes away, drops a lot. And so, if you then look at the combined, uh, combined plot of the thermosphere and ionosphere, you get a picture that looks something like this on average. I'm giving this plot out here because you don't usually see the ionosphere and the thermosphere on the same plot because there's a lot more neutrals than there are ions. At solar maximum, 
in red here. Uh, maybe a factor of a million in the lower ionosphere, even up here at the peak of the ionosphere, it's a factor of a thousand before between ions and neutrals. And, and uh, so you could say that the uh, ionosphere is a very weakly ionized plasma. You could also say that the neutrals are largely in charge. Even though the ions carry a lot of the energy, the neutrals can push them around because they're so much more numerous. Now, the ionosphere doesn't look like a simple uh, constant uh, altitude thing like I've been showing just for explanatory purposes. It has a huge amount of structure, especially around the equator. Uh, this is a simple empirical model of the ionosphere. The day side's over here, and stretching into the night side are these, are these uh, intertropical arcs or, or uh, the equatorial ionization anomaly, the, the regions of high ionosphere density that straddle the magnetic equator, which goes right through the middle of these fields. Remember the, the magnetic field of the Earth is offset from the pole and also somewhat distorted, especially in the American sector. So you have a lot of morphology in the ionosphere. It's a very dynamic place, especially in response to space weather. And that's a lot of what we're trying to understand here. So I have some model simulations uh, just to try to explain how this all gets stirred up by geomagnetic activity, by, by space weather, by solar storms. Um, this, this is a, a series of, uh, of uh, uh, projections, the way you would see the Earth from a great distance, such as a geostationary orbit. And, and I'm showing here the lower ionosphere, the upper ionosphere, thermospheric temperature, and the composition of the thermosphere, that atomic oxygen to molecular nitrogen ratio, which I'm going to call O to N2 in the common lingo of our field. So I'm going to set this into motion. First, you'll see the, the effect of an auroral disturbance on the lower ionosphere where the aurora happens. You'll see the aurora bloom up. And then we'll follow through and watch how this is uh, the first day. is a quiet day. And then here comes the storm. And then it subsides and finally settles down. Now let's look at the temperature, see how that responded. Well, first day is kind of quiet. You have a little day-night. And the storm hits. And the temperature disturbance starts at the high latitudes. It soon spreads to the lower latitudes in about a, less than a day. And then the composition really shows that. While the storm is in progress, this big band of uh, oxygen depletion spreads all the way to the equator, and it has a big effect on the upper ionosphere at those latitudes. Even though the storm started in the polar regions, it really disturbs the equatorial ionosphere. And, and just so... Um, just so we can uh, uh, watch them all together, which is a little hard to follow, but uh, you know, I'll just play them all together so you can see the storm in progress as the aurora breaks out and its temperature spreads and the composition responds, and finally the ionosphere is greatly disturbed. Then after a couple of days, it's settled back down. So. Uh, so what are we going to do with gold to try to understand all this? And what is gold? I'm just going to give a quick review here. Gold is global scale observations of the Roman disk. It's a spectrograph. It's an ultraviolet imaging spectrograph, which means that it, that it makes an image with one dimension being an imaging dimension, the other being a, spec, a spectrum of light. And from that, we hope to be able to infer temperature and composition and electron content. And we're going to do it from geostationary orbit. This is a little cartoon of what the Earth might look like in geostationary orbit. Here's the satellite that's carrying us and, and, and the instrument. So, um, so gold has, has two channels. They're identical. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. Well, NASA likes it because it gives you some redundancy. If one of the channels breaks for some reason, you still have another. It also gives you the ability to do monitoring with one channel and do campaign observations for the sites with the other channel. And, and if you're just doing the same thing with both channel, well, you double your photon count, and that's good. And so it has completely programmable observing modes. We have a standard mode, but we can program it to do all sorts of different types of observations. We make images of the so-called disk, that, that full image of the Earth. And limb scans, the limb is the edge of the Earth. And we scan the limb, that means that we, that we uh, go along the edge of the Earth so we can get some altitude information. 
Uh, we measure temperature and O to N2, that composition ratio, at night, at day. In the night, we see the ionosphere in an O plus emission. That's the ionized atomic oxygen. We also do stellar occultations. It's deployed on a geostationary communication satellite. Uh, it's provided by a company known as SES. Uh, GS is Government Services. And it's uh, carried on an Airbus satellite at 47 and a half degrees west longitude, and of course over the equator, because geostationary means you're in an equatorial orbit at an altitude of about 36,000 kilometers, which is an altitude at which the satellite rotates at the same rate of the Earth, so it's always over the same point at the Earth, or in a little box that's over the same point at the Earth. It moves very, just a little bit around in that box. And it was uh, launched uh, last January. Oh, first, first uh, here's just a picture of the ComSat that's carrying us. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, uh, its, main its main purpose is to carry these, uh, these transceivers and to provide uh, uh, t television and communication services uh, throughout the, the Americas, but especially, I think this one has, uh, also has a particularly uh, South, South American mission. And it was uh, launched in a geostationary, geosynchronous transfer orbit. That's, a, uh, that's an orbit that's highly elliptical. And it lasts January. And then it gradually uh, is boosted to geo using a fairly new thing called electric propulsion. Uh, there's a lot of energy coming out of these big solar panels. So they use it to, uh, to uh, power these little ion motors that... Uh, that gradually lifted to a geostationary orbit. It got there just a couple of weeks ago, and they're doing satellite checkout and commissioning the bus, and I believe everything is going very well. Uh, we don't turn on until September, and we won't take regular data until October, but uh, everything is on track. I was at the launch, I got this picture. It was very dramatic, uh, much brighter than I would have imagined, even though we were five miles away uh, went the, 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 the trajectory was a little different from from what they had aimed surprisingly enough but they uh, they uh, recovered it and thanks to electric propulsion were able to uh, correct the orbit and get it uh, on geostationary just about on schedule so let me try to explain how we make our measurement I said we're going to make a spectral measurement that means we disperse the light cross a slit. We look at the world through a slit and we place that slit so it's getting all the light from the disk of the earth in a little band and then we disperse the light in that band. So we get a spectrum and what we see in that spectrum is going to be this atomic oxygen emission. So it's called a doublet. But think, of, think of it as a line. It's two very closely spaced lines. And then in a little uh, longer wavelength region we have these N2 Lyman Burge Hopfield bands. And, and uh, they, they uh, uh, have a number of weaker emissions, but you can add them all together and get a good, a good indication of how much light is being emitted by molecular nitrogen as opposed to atomic oxygen. Now, the temperature is difficult and, uh, uh, and, and cutting edge measurement. It's, a, it's kind of a new thing, to, and no one's ever done this in geostationary. And what you do is you look at the shape of this band. The hotter it is, the broader the band. So that means you have to do these at very high resolution. The composition is a little easier because you just take the ratio, of the intensity here, to, of this, this line, this atomic oxygen emission here, to the uh, LBH bands. And then on the limb, you can look at the altitude slopes. And I mentioned stellar occultations. We can get molecular oxygen from that. You may remember there's still a little bit of molecular oxygen, O2, in the thermosphere. And then at night, we see, uh, we see O plus, uh, we see the ionosphere uh, using a different type of emission, but it's, it's only visible in the atomic oxygen line at 135.6 nanometers. So this is what we hope to see. And th these are where I'll show you some simulations that we've been doing in preparation for launch um, in order to be able to understand what we see. Uh, this is a, what we call an air glow simulation. Air glow is a light given off by the upper atmosphere. This is a, sort of a twilight case. This is the Terminator over here. Over here is the daytime, and we're getting daytime emissions from sunlight uh, hitting atoms and molecules, making 
what we call photoelectrons, which in turn make, makes, makes the light that we see in that spectrum. This part is the night, and this is this recombination emission coming from atomic oxygen ion, O+. Plus. And this is much, much fainter. And so this is, this is challenging because it's, this is very bright, this is very dim, but, uh, relatively speaking. These are ultraviolet emissions, and none of them are very bright at all. So uh, this is just a typical day, uh, empirical atmosphere, uh, just average conditions, and, and I'll let it loop. Uh, and so you can see there's the, day, there's the day side emission, here's the night side emission. And while all that's going on, you notice that you can see the aurora on the edge. Now, this is sort of an average, quiet, medium quiet aurora. But uh, uh, we, it's going to be, we sort of see it on edge. It's going to be hard to interpret it, but we, we, we do expect to see it. And, and so you also can see during the day, you can see well, there's some structure in the uh, atomic oxygen emission. A little hard to understand because the viewing geometry is changing as you go by. But uh, I'll, I'll show you how we're going to try to interpret that. So, so here's an illustration of that observing uh, strategy. Remember, we have a slit. And we disperse across the slit, so we get a spectrum. And across, along the slit, we get an image. And that image is going to look something like this. It's going to, have, it's going to be bright, where the Earth is bright, dark, where the Earth is dark, and then up here, we can just see the, a little bit of the aurora. So now, that's good, but how do we get an image going this way in longitude? Well, what we do is we scan the slit across the Earth and build up a third dimension. And that's why we call it an image cube. An image cube is two spatial dimensions and a spectral dimension. We assemble that by taking a, an image square, so to speak, and uh, in, in, in one dimension in latitude and the other dimension in spectrum, and then we build up the longitude dimension by scanning. So, so I'm going to try to illustrate that. Here comes the slit scanning across here. First it sees the daytime, then it sees a little aurora, and it goes into the night. Now at night, you only see the atomic oxygen emission. All those LVH bands go away. And then we go back and we do the southern hemisphere. And we come off the night, we come into the day, and finally we go off the edge of the earth, and we see the limb of the earth, and that completes a two-part scan. And remember, we have two channels. So while one channel is doing this, the other channel will be sort of doing it in reverse, and so that we uh, can get a full disk every 15 minutes by, by uh, scanning the northern hemisphere of one channel and the southern hemisphere of the other channel. So here's a simulation of how the, uh, these emissions are expected to respond to a major storm. It was a fairly long time ago, but we like this storm. It's called the AGU storm because we were, several of us at a meeting of the American Geophysical Union at the time, and so uh, everybody was talking about the storm, and uh, at least everybody in the space weather field. So here's atomic oxygen. Like I showed before, but when the storm hits, the, uh, there's the aurora and the atomic oxygen is disturbed. You can see that there's a little structure in there, but it's hard to tell what's going on. Also at night, you might notice that things changed a lot in the nighttime ionosphere. This is incidentally the same storm that I showed in those previous simulations. Now let's look at, uh, let's look at the nitrogen emission. It's dark at night. There's no nitrogen emission at night. But when the storm hits, you can see it in the nitrogen emission as well. And again, there's, there's stuff changing during the day, but it's hard to tell what. So in order to try to sort that out, the media tool we use, of course, is to take the ratio of these two things. And, and that is represented by this animation. Now, the orange is stuff that's oxygen heavy. And the blue is stuff that's nitrogen heavy. And the dark, the, the darkish black, is, is the night side of the earth, where well, we can't do this because there's no nitrogen emission. So I just blocked out the night. So, so just look from the daytime and let's see how the storm affected that ratio. So here's a quiet day. Here comes the storm. And there goes that band of nitrogen going all the way to the equator and depleting the oxygen everywhere except in that little band by the equator. So, so this 
shows you how the thermosphere responds to the ionosphere responding to the auroral disturbance. And then, of course, I mentioned that the thermosphere being, being much denser than the ionosphere, it pushes the ionosphere around and changes it. So what we're trying to do with all of this is, well, fulfill our scientific objective. These are our official NASA scientific objectives. Um, how do these geomagnetic storms alter the temperature and composition structure of the thermosphere? And what is the response on a global scale to uh, all this solar variability that I talked about in the, in the extreme ultraviolet? And then another thing I won't be talking about, but we'll have a webinar on this uh, subsequently, is the effects of the atmosphere. There's all sorts of interesting space weather that, that comes out of the atmosphere below the ionosphere. Yeah. And the ionosphere is embedded in the thermosphere. The thermosphere is just the upper reaches of the atmosphere. And the lower atmosphere has a lot to say about how the ionosphere is configured, especially in that equatorial region where you have those big arcs on either side of the magnetic equator. And then finally, we want to understand uh, these, these irregular features that appear in the nighttime ionosphere that we don't have time to talk about today, but maybe we'll have another thing on those. So, so what I'm going to try to explain, this is kind of, this is kind of, this is a kind of a texty slide, but I'm going to try to walk you through why this, this ratio is so important. It's been observed a lot before, but never from, never the big picture from, from geostationary like this before. Uh, so here's the logic of it. I told you that the, that the thermosphere is mostly atomic oxygen, molecular nitrogen. This O to N2 ratio is, is reflective of the atomic to molecular. Molecules are heavier, they're low down, and the atoms are lighter, they're higher up due to this diffusive separation. So the O to N2 ratio tells you something about the vertical winds that move the atmosphere, the thermosphere, up and down. The vertical winds are diagnostic of what's going on in the general wind pattern, the, the general circulation of the thermosphere. Now the ionosphere is strongly influenced by this because the atomic the molecular composition controls the chemistry of the ionosphere. When there's more molecules that react to the ions then they deplete the ionosphere. So those, play, those regions near the low latitudes where you've got a lot of nitrogen coming up into the ionosphere that those have the effect of, of eating up the ionosphere. But at the same time, you have winds pushing the ions around, and that changes the density. And then you have electric fields, especially when the magnetosphere, ionosphere circuit is amplified by these storm effects, and carried by auroral currents, it changes the electric field of the entire ionosphere, that changes the atmospheric circulation, and, and uh, the ions and, and neutrals are both moved around by these fields, uh, depending basically on who's got the most total energy. And finally, we have, you know, we've been trying to understand these processes for years. Our, we have these powerful numerical models that run on supercomputers. They contain atoms and molecules and ions and all of the energetics and, and electrodynamics and wind processes. They're like weather models, but much more complicated. And we think they do a good job of describing the ionosphere thermosphere system, but during these big disturbances, all bets are off. Uh, it's very difficult to know if your model is doing any good, and we always want to make them better. So we need better measurements. Uh, just as uh, weather forecasters need better measurements of the lower atmosphere, we need better measurements of the upper atmosphere to make our models better. And from a modeling standpoint, that's, that's enough reason in and of itself. Um, we have societal benefits. We believe that we can advance the whole space weather field. Heliophysics is a NASA word, meaning the uh, science of the sun, the solar wind, the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, uh, the whole space weather system. And uh, we want to, I mentioned, develop not just improved models we have, but we have a whole new generation of whole atmosphere models that do the weather and climate of the lower atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, and even ultimately the magnetosphere. Um, we want to be able to, to give people a better idea of what might be interfering with, with communication and navigation. Um, orbital tracking is important because as the thermosphere heats up, it expands 
and uh, that causes more drag on orbiting objects, and there are a lot of orbiting objects now. And finally, we hope that uh, the public will, will find our ultraviolet images of the Earth, uh, although they're quite different and, and maybe uh, uh, not as, as accessible, I mean, accessible in a, in a uh, easy to understand way as your typical cloud maps. But uh, we think that our space weather maps uh, might be of interest to people uh, other, other than the uh, scientific community. So most space weather happens in this near Earth space, ionosphere, thermosphere. It has uh, effects on uh, radio communications, navigation, satellite orbits. Uh, we want to be able to forecast it. Um, we can just about now cast it. It's very difficult to get a long range forecast because these space weather things happen so fast, but we would at least maybe try to get short range forecasts, uh, maybe just a few hours, or in the case of the ionosphere, uh, maybe longer. Uh, in the same way that, we, that, that, that uh, people do for tropospheric weather. Um, we especially would like to be able to say something about thermospheric density because it's important for the uh, problem of the uh, atmospheric drag on satellites and the many, many pieces of non-functioning debris in space. Uh, we think we've made a lot of progress on this, but we need new measurements. We need to... to uh, to validate our models, we need to understand the energy flow, the dynamic response to storms, and especially the uh, thermosphere control of the ionosphere, because the ionosphere has, uh, has more measure, there's more measurements of the ionosphere than there are of the thermosphere. Uh, it's, it's precisely because you can bounce radio waves off of it. Thermosphere dynamics are a little harder to measure. And we've learned a lot from the low Earth orbit satellites uh, that get lines or swaths of measurements through the through the ionosphere and thermosphere, but uh, we think the next is take, uh, to advance the field and really understand thermosphere, ionosphere variability. Uh, we need global measurements. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to uh, uh, field some questions if there are any. Stan, we did have one question from a little bit earlier, which was, is there anything we can do if we had a solar storm like the 1859 Carrington event? to protect our power grid? You may not have the answer to that, but we would appreciate it. That's a good question because there's a lot of, been a lot of speculation about exactly how intense that Carrington event was. That was a, an event where uh, the, there was a flare so bright that it was visible in white light. And uh, it's an it's a, uh, iconic event in our field because, because Carrington, uh, hence the Carrington event, uh, um, uh, associate, associated the observation of that flare with disturbances to the magnetic field of the Earth as measured by, uh, by magnetometers. And so, um, and I think the telegraph operators and so forth noticed that sort of thing. So, so it was, uh, it was uh, one of the uh, early connections of events on the sun to events on the Earth and uh, an indication that there was such a thing as an ionosphere, which hadn't quite been discovered yet this being you know, before Marconi. Um, it, it's not well known exactly how intense that event could be. And if we knew that, we would have a better idea of knowing how intense an event can be. Um, having some warning can, uh, can hopefully give power grid operators the opportunity to take a million of measurements, uh, measures. Now, I'm not an expert on what those measures might be. Uh, from our perspective, our job is to say, we have some idea uh, that something might be coming, and maybe we have some idea of how severe it might be. And then uh, longer range, we would like to be able to do a better job of describing the ionospheric current system that ends up in, uh, in near the surface of the Earth uh, the reason that power grids uh, are, are potentially a problem is simply that they have very long lines, so you have a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of distance for the uh, electric fields to uh, manifest themselves as currents. Now, um, and, there, and there, there have been historically some power outages caused by space weather. Um, so so uh, 
So solving that problem doesn't involve just space weather, but it also involves the understanding the conductivity of the Earth itself uh, and the composition of the crust. And so it's a very complicated problem. Um, and, and I don't think that, that we anticipate having you know, vast specificity saying, you will have a current at this location and it might blow out that transformer. But at minimum, you can do the kind of things that satellite operators do when they think that something might be happening which is staff up, be alert, uh, put on extra monitoring uh, 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 capabilities, and uh, be prepared to take uh, to take action. Whether that means you know uh, isolating certain parts of the grid or whatever the power companies do about it. Great, uh, folks. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to put those in the chat, and I will. Pass those along to Stan. Um, here's another one, Stan. Are there incidents of satellites in low Earth orbit being adversely affected by space weather? How could better space weather forecasting help with development of the LEO commercial economy? There certainly are. Um, the um, the the the, the main problem is that uh, in, in low Earth orbit, where the radiation environment isn't too bad, uh, the main problem is the satellite drag, uh, changes the orbits. Uh, sometimes, sometimes NORAD uh, loses satellites, or uh, if, if there's a change in the orbit that's it's a little unanticipated, they don't pick it up on the radar. They have to they have to go into a, a search mode, and since there's over ten thousand objects in low Earth orbit now, it's a big problem for them to, to, to uh, track all that stuff. Um, they are now using uh, a, a data assimilation version of empirical models that, that give them a better understanding of how the satellite drag environment is changing, so they, don't, so they, do, they do better than they were. Uh, we think that ultimately numerical modeling will be the future for specifying what the the satellite drag environment is. Um, we're not there yet, or at least not in terms of operationally, but there's a very active field in trying to use our models to do a better job of, of uh, specifying uh, what the density of the thermosphere is, uh, usually using historical data at this point. And so I think that, that better space weather forecasting could definitely help the, the satellite tracking problem and, and maybe the collision avoidance problem. And in terms of the, of the low Earth orbit commercial economy, I mean, there's all these ideas out there for CubeSats and microsats, communication satellites, or the, or the Iridium satellites. Um, there's, there's so many functioning things in space that uh, we absolutely need to do a good job of, of making sure we know where all of them are, especially the little ones that are a little harder to track. And so, uh, and also we need to do a good job of making sure that, that the junk doesn't build up. I think the modern protocols specify that you have to have a deorbit plan for low Earth orbit. And, and that's a good thing because, because, um, uh, because his, in the history of the last few decades, there's been a huge buildup of space junk, space debris. And, and uh, the debris is as deadly as the functioning satellites. Um, of course, the biggest contributions to space debris were, um, shall we say, anthropogenic. Um, it turns out it's a really bad idea to blow stuff up in low Earth orbit. And so hopefully, uh, the countries that have a vested interest in the cleanliness of space will stop doing that. Oh, uh, please describe the current image. Uh, I was hoping somebody would ask. This is an iconic image in our field. It, uh, um, let me go to, I think if I go to slideshow mode, I can point. So let me go back to slideshow mode here. Um, this was a, this is the first ultraviolet image of the Earth. It was taken from Apollo 16 on the surface of the moon. It was a, an image intensified film camera. They bought, brought plates back to Earth and developed them there. It's very low resolution, 
but it seems to show some of those same features that I was talking about. This is the illuminated day side of the Earth, but this is not sunlight per se you're looking at. This is ultraviolet emissions, very much like gold we'll see, but at very low resolution. These, of course, are stars. The, and these bands here are those equatorial ionization anomalies, the, the places where the, uh, the ionosphere is very intense and uh, uh, straddling the magnetic equator. And so you can even see those from space. This is the southern hemisphere of Rome. So these, uh, this, this image, uh, although low resolution and very broad band, there's hardly any spectral information in here, uh, it sort of integrates over that whole region I was showing you in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, plot. Um, but it still captures the essence of all those features uh, that, we, uh, that we hope to measure with uh, far greater uh, precision. So um, let's see, uh, I, I can read this chat box here so I can read the questions myself. Um, how have localized thermosphere effects been correlated to GPS errors? Uh, yes, uh, very much so, but ionosphere, it's, it's the ionosphere that throws off the radio signals. Uh, that's because um, the ionosphere causes a delay in transmission and GPS is, uh, uh, the GPS signal is, uh, is the timing of the GPS signal is extraordinarily important for, for accurate navigational positioning. Um, so, so what they do about that is they, they measure the GPS delay at two frequencies because the delay is different at, at the two different frequencies. And that gives them an idea of how much the ionosphere is how much, you know, how dense the ionosphere is between the GPS satellite and the ground at any given place where they have these special two frequency stations. And then they relay those, uh, that data through ge geostationary satellites of all things. And your, your, uh, your so-called WAS corrected GPS unit uh, can, can then utilize that data to correct the ionosphere delay. And that works pretty good if you have enough WAS stations and if the ionosphere is pretty regular. If the ionosphere is all disrupted and there's all sorts of gradients, that method starts to break down. And then when it starts to break down, the system's smart enough to say, WAS isn't working anymore. And you get, and you get these outages where GPS is, uh, is uh, not performing as well as it should. And, and for aviation, for instance, this could be really important. So you could put a dual frequency or triple frequency GPS in every receiver, you can use WAS, you can use this more high resolution WAS. Uh, people like farmers that use GPS for precision plowing, they put a differential GPS station in the corner of their field. These are all really good engineering solutions. Um, now, one great thing about all of this dual frequency GPS monitoring is, it's measuring the ionosphere. So we get those measurements, we utilize those measurements, to see how well our ionosphere models are doing. And so, so that's a really great thing. Now, we'd also like to be able to use these powerful ionosphere models to uh, now cast and maybe short-term forecast the ionosphere so that you could do an even better job of correcting GPS errors. Now, that's still pretty difficult. You have to have a pretty good model to do better than the actual measurements. So, so, uh, so that may be farther in the future. You, a lot of times there are engineering solutions to these problems that are, I'm gonna be honest here, you know, I, I wanna promote the scientific modeling approach, but, but sometimes the engineering solution is the way to go. Probably for the long term, the best thing we'll be able to do is some kind of data assimilation model that combines these, uh, these measurements of the ionosphere these dual frequency and three frequency uh, GPS receivers with powerful numerical models and by assimilating all that data, but using the model to, to connect it and maybe even forecast it a little. That might be the ultimate way to go. That's, that's, uh, that's a ways into the future, but it's the kind of thing that we're working on.
So let's see, uh, you mentioned that a goal of this type of research is to forecast space weather analogously to atmospheric weather with the forecast models themselves use similar technologies and be visual like the radar imagery on television weather broadcasts, to what extent might mathematical modeling be used as solar weather prediction evolves. Uh, this is mathematical modeling and it's very analogous to troposphere weather models. In fact, our biggest new model which is called the whole atmosphere community climate model, utilizes a tropospheric model. It's actually a climate model, but it's the same technology that drives the weather models. Um, we, we, we use the same mathematical approach to describe the equations that describe the motions of the winds. And absolutely, we would use similar technologies um, for the visualization and the data analysis uh, and, and, and the type of imagery that would enable people to say, oh, look, the answer is changing here. Um, you can even get that imagery uh, from those GPS measurements I was talking about. There's things you can find on the web that show you um, a sort of a low resolution guess of what the ionosphere is doing right now. Now to forecast it is tougher because the ionosphere is being pushed around by the magnetosphere, the thermosphere, and all of that's being driven by the sun. And the sun, is very difficult to forecast. But the ultimate goal is to be able to observe something that happened on the sun and using the advanced, the advanced notice, as it were, that's built into the space weather system, be able to do short-term forecasting and, and, uh, and, and visualizing the result. I, I think, you know, just because just you mentioned the visual, like the radar imagery, uh, uh, radar imagery of the, past up into the present has been common online for several decades now, and you can see it on TV and so forth. Um, but the thing I've noticed in the last 10 years is increasingly the, the local weather channels uh, or you know, the local news will have a, a weather forecast for tomorrow, and they'll, they'll simulate what they expect the radar imagery to look like tomorrow. And, and that's very challenging because you know, a lot of detail, a lot of chaos is going on. Uh, but a lot of times they're, they're not far off. And, and uh, to get to that point uh, with that very advanced uh, technology and a huge amount of data collection, uh, data assimilation goes into those types of models. And uh, we're certainly not there yet in space weather. Um, and it's a harder problem because there's more going on. There's all these electric fields, there's the magnetosphere to worry about. But uh, we do have one advantage in trying to catch up with the, the, the troposphere weather guys. And that is, unlike the dawn of weather forecasting, when they were running on computers that are less powerful than your phone, we now have the advantage of massively parallel supercomputers. So we can do a lot of dumb calculations. And uh, so if you have a bad model, you can make it run really fast. We just want to make them better. All right, we may have time for one more question. If anyone has a last minute uh, question with Stan. And lots of thank yous and compliments on your presentation. Very Sweet. much welcome. If there are no other questions, um, we'll go ahead and sign off and you all please stay uh, in touch. We'll put out information. Um, on our next webinar in the coming weeks. And then we all, all are looking forward, as Adrienne uh, commented, she's looking forward to getting some gold data in October. So uh, keep and following. Hopefully, hopefully we'll have some images on, on the website. In the, in the early going, you know, uh, don't expect them to be too exciting. <laughs> it's sun's pretty quiet now, but at least we'll be able to see the earth from space and, and you know, I'm sort of, I guess you got the flavor, and I'm sort of thinking of this as a space weather station, and maybe someday it'll even be in the NOAA data stream. All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, Stan, thank you for presenting, uh, that was great. And we'll see you all at our next GOLD webinar. Thank you.